have we been abandoned suraj i think they just um, the <laughs> they go the i think yeah we're just we're just waiting and then we'll show ourselves uh once we get the um, okay okay i think we'll uh, we'll begin um i'd like to welcome you all to our discussion today on new writings on vr of vicar i wanted to bring into conversation <coughs> excuse me a group of us who've published or as in my case <clears throat> are about to publish with Shailaja Paik edited volumes on different aspects of the thought of B.R. Ambedkar. I'm not going to introduce today's speakers, <clears throat> Drs. Rath uh, Rathod and Yengde in any great detail. We'd be here all day if we did. Suraj is rightfully famous for his book, Cast Matters, and for the dense archive of critical public commentary that he's produced and for today's discussion, uh, we'll be focusing in particular on his role as the editor of The Radical in Ambedkar, together with Anand Teltumde, who continues to languish in jail. Akash Singh Rathod has produced numerous works on legal and political philosophy, a critical edition of the Buddha and his Dhamma, and more recently, Ambedkar's Preamble, A Secret History of the Indian Constitution, and again, for the purposes of today's discussion, uh, it is the five volume series, B.R. Ambedkar's Quest for Justice, which was the outcome of the Bangalore Conference of 2017 uh, that we'll be focusing on. Now, many of us are also part of a strong and distinctive group of scholars, political theorists, intellectual historians, legal thinkers, working on single authored monographs on Ambedkar's thought. But before we can really engage those singular works, it seemed to me that it might be worth taking a few steps back to have a conversation about what is emerging as a field that we might call critical Ambedkar studies. And that's what we'd like to do today by way of an open-ended conversation with both Suraj and Akash. Thank you both very much for joining us. A few quick announcements before we begin. Uh, this term we've carried programming by our ACLS postdoc, Tabisile Griffin. Please join us for the final talk in the series that she's organized this Wednesday evening EST here online with Lauren Tate Baeza. We have a conversation on cost and law, which is scheduled for April 1 at the same time, 11 a.m. EST. And we have keynotes on April 20th and April 22nd by the artist Shazia Sikandar, and by political philosopher and artist, Dennis Ferreira de Silva, respectively, as a part of our ICLS annual conference on mass intellectuality. This will round out our programming for the semester and uh, please do join us for our forthcoming events. Now today's focus is on an emergent thought space, critical and Baker studies, which uh, is in conversation with uh, studies that attend to the life worlds and to the constitutive role of caste and untouchability as the political unconscious of the Indian social, as I've argued elsewhere. But we also need to take into account the ways in which critical and Baker studies might be in conversation with other critical studies of caste, its history, and its present, and indeed the challenge posed by histories of other caste communities for how we might approach Ambedkar and or the Dalit question. Now for today's conversation, it seemed worth approaching Ambedkar as an event in the history of thought. Someone who challenges the norms of political philosophy, the ways of doing it, and who in a very particular and in a distinctive manner brings the abstract and the existential together in his own thinking. This um, approach or the ways in which we might approach Ambedkar, it seems to me pose distinctive problems of method, but it also begins to place Ambedkar within and without South Asia. And I don't need to repeat here the work that many of us have done to challenge uh, the, the, the frames, the confines of anti-colonial thought, the focus on Indian anti-colonialism and Indian nationalism, and the kind of deep strictures that this places on how we might even begin to approach a thinker of the kind of expanse, uh, the capaciousness of Ambedkar. 
So the question might be, what kind of a thinker is Ambedkar? How do we approach classic questions of influence, of the relationship between text and context, or of social thought and social history and the relationship between them? Readings that view Ambedkar as taking up and extending questions already posed by, say, Benjamin or Derrida or, Gram uh, or Gramsci exist, but we might also want to think about works that are responsible to his complex Indian, American, and British formations, but which fall short, perhaps, of offering a theoretical engagement with Ambedkar as a theorist or a political philosopher. So wherein lie some of the insufficiencies, the limits of some of the work that we have as well. And because the relationship between history and theory is something that is both peculiar and particular, something that grounds our post-colonial condition, how do we think the historical and the utopian in Ambedkar's own thought? And how might we historicize critical Ambedkar studies today? It's certainly not the case that there haven't been rich studies of various aspects of Ambedkar's thought. And here I'm only thinking uh, about English, uh, work in English, such as biographies by Kermode, uh, well, Marathi, but English biographies by Kir, um, and other work that signaled the importance of attending to various aspects of Ambedkar's thought. Ahir uh, by M.S. Gore, Sukhdev Thorat, by Gail Omvit, Eleanor Zelliot, amongst others. And of course, by referring to Kermore, I'm also referring to a much longer tradition of writing and thinking and excerpting and annotating that exists in Marathi in particular, as we know. Um, and we could speak about some of that uh, too today, I hope. But it seems to me that in approaching what we call critical Ambedkar studies today, we're posing some distinctive questions about the archive. So what is the archive? for Ambedkar's thought, where does it live? How do we get access to it? And we know that there have been lots of conversations about uh, the BAWS, uh, the source material, uh, the kind of uh, lag between Ambedkar's uh, own passing in 56, and then the start of the publications around BAWS, Vasanth Moon's own uh, efforts to, to edit that work, which began in 1976. So the question of Ambedkar's archive, what is Ambedkar's archive? Where does it live? There are questions I think also about annotation, which is itself a critical method of reading and engagement to my mind, because what, some, what someone read also tells us how and why they read something, but also what kinds of connections they made, unexpected connections between texts, between thinkers, but also might, what might have been left out in uh, thinking through reading via annotation. But there have been efforts at annotation. Uh, and I think um, Akash has been engaged in this, some of the Navayana annotations of uh, uh, the madness of Manu, for instance, or uh, riddles in uh, Hinduism and so on, uh, are efforts at new modes of annotating or more uh, critically annotating, seriously annotating some of uh, Ambedkar's work. And then there are the edited volumes that we're going to speak about today which are to my mind collective acts, but they're also forms of generous reading, which both respect distinctive approaches to and demand rigorous engagement with the thought of Ambedkar in many modes. And then finally, perhaps we might also think about the many um, sort of courses, the, the, the public pedagogy that is uh, begun uh, over the last many years uh, for uh, reading Ambedkar, reading Ambedkar's work, his words, reading uh, them in our time, but also thinking through the context of his own time. But these are all modes of what I would call mass intellectuality. They're about democratic education. And they're about taking uh, the university outside of its confines, but also challenging university modes of knowledge. Um, and then finally, the question uh, that we'll maybe attend to today as well, is there an early and a late Ambedkar? Do we periodize a kind of break? How do we actually approach reading Ambedkar and his texts? So these are some of the many questions that are on the table. Uh, we just have uh, about an hour and 15 minutes with each other. So as I said, this is uh, inaugurating what I hope will be a continued conversation. And uh, when the three of us were discussing how we might uh, attend to some of the many questions on the table, we thought what we would do is to adopt the mode of uh, 
sort of uh, thinking uh, or working around sort of two iterations of conversation. The first, I will uh, invite both Akash and Suraj to take maybe about 10 minutes to speak about their edited volumes, uh, their conditions of emergence, and their own approaches to reading and interpreting Ambedkar that they advocate in and through the volumes themselves, and perhaps speaking also about some of the texts uh, in those edited volumes, some of the essays there, the kinds of conversations, the unexpected resonances, or indeed the kind of uh, agonistic frameworks that might have organized uh, some of the essays uh, that they put together. And once we do that, um, I think we will open for a kind of conversation with each other. And then we'd like to take a kind of second moment where we come back and think through precisely this question of uh, if there was one text of Ambedkar's that you might really want to think about reading together today in the short time we have together, uh, which one might it be? And how might we think about periodizing uh, Ambedkar's work and writings? Um, uh, in, in, in that context. So again, thank you all. And uh, Akash, may I invite you to begin and then uh, we'll move to Suraj. Uh, sure, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. And um, it's great to see, well, no one is in person yet, but I haven't, I haven't looked at Suraj's handsome face in so long. So even, even virtual is, is nice. Um, so I'm I'm talking about uh, something that is difficult to to lift to lift. Uh, it's a massive project. Uh, these uh, five volumes that have come out from uh, Oxford University Press last year, which uh, had their origins in the 2017 Bangalore uh, conference on Ambedkar, where we uh, brought together more than 350 scholars and activists, as well as um, uh, uh, politicians, to see what we could thrash out in terms of one document, which was referred to as the Bangalore Declaration, which was meant to be a sort of um, Ambedkar-inspired resolution that um, all of the progressive political parties could sign on to. Uh, the declaration was indeed signed, but unfortunately, as with these political aspirations, not a great deal came out of it. So I didn't find any of the ensuing um, party manifestos that the declaration was was uh, was given a, a great deal of attention. Nevertheless, the activists and the uh, academics, I think, had more fruitful um, discussions, and and I think this collection uh, gives you know gives gives us all of those of us who contributed to it a, a sense that um, coming together in that rather ridiculously large way in Bangalore in 2017 was um, was in the end uh, fruitful even though it didn't bear uh, political fruit there were about uh, 300 proper papers presented and uh, the, the works that um, that were selected for, for publication uh, here were selected, of course, through a, a blind peer review process by Oxford. So I didn't have that much control over what uh, finally came in um, into the volumes. I'd, I had shortlisted about 150 out of the 350 papers and then the peer referees more or less started. Uh, their work, and um, and we have, in the end, around 75 uh, different authors contributing, um, which is, you know, about uh, 10 to 15 uh, for each of the volumes, but I'm including the forward writers uh, um, and the um, editorial board as well. So uh, I, that to preface that I didn't have a great deal of uh, you know, in the, in the way you were framing your question, I didn't have a great deal of like editorial uh, steering in terms of the content um, coming up with uh, some way of making the approach consistent. But anyone who has a look at the volume sees that, that it's not so much about uh, bringing together one way of reading on Bitka, but uh, rather highlighting 
that Ambedkar can and must be read from many disciplines, many vantage points, and um, and uh, one of the hallmarks of these five volumes, um, many jurisdictions. I mean, I say jurisdiction as a as a lawyer. Let's say many different places. So the contributors come from all over the world. I mean, literally every continent, and um, uh, and it's it's profoundly interdisciplinary. Even the the way the topics are arranged, so we have volumes that are guided by different spheres of justice. Uh, Political justice is the first volume, social justice the second, legal and economic justice the third volume, uh, gender and racial justice the fourth volume, religious and cultural justice the the fifth volume. So what these these sort of spheres or domains of justice serve to do is um, organize very uh, generally different interdisciplinary, sometimes critical um, uh, approaches to uh, to 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 these um, what I call this 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 sphere of justice. So, in other words, um, uh, let's say uh, gender and racial racial justice. How can uh, the idea of gender justice be inspired by? the legacy and thought of, uh, of uh, Dr. Ambedkar or legal justice or economic justice and, and so on. So uh, in each of the cases, the authors have generally attempted either to articulate Ambedkar's um, own uh, position in respect to this concept, like uh, gender justice, for example, or have attempted to deal in their own way with the concept of gender justice as inspired by, uh, by Ambedkar. And I find this uh, this sort of divergence or this option very fruitful because, on the one hand, you might have, um, for example, Upendra Bakshi writes in the Legal Justice volume. Uh, Bakshi, as we all know, is um, let's say occasionally profoundly inspired by uh, Ambedkar, but the, the the majority of his of his uh, very vast writing is not um, either about Ambedkar or, or necessarily has anything to do with, with Ambedkar. So what we get in an essay from him um, and many others is how to think about jurisprudence the way that the dictates of, of legal justice in an Ambedkarite lens uh, demand. So I find that, uh, I find that really interesting um, to have that that variability. So I can either talk about what Amitka thought about it, or I can talk about something um, the way that I'm inspired to do so from from Amitka's life and work. Uh, I could go on. I mean, I have given talks, unfortunately, for hours on the volumes because there are, um, you know, so many, uh, uh, so many contributions uh, that are worth touching upon. But there are two things that I want to say that's going to come, that I'll come back to later when we talk about, um, you know, new critical, uh, new works in, in critical and sense. sense. One is, um, how do we call this, uh, the notion of compromise or, or let's say when we're, when we're, when we're, when we seek to, to bring out new work on Ambedkar in a, in a domain that is not necessarily friendly. So in this case, the uh, the peer referees at Oxford University Press, for example, you're not going to find, for the most part, you're not going to find that a publishing house like Oxford is going to send work to uh, Dalit uh, uh, peer referees. So, uh, so when you're dealing with an academic gate, gatekeeping, which is of course part of the job of peer refereeing, you've got to overcome a great number of, of hurdles, especially when the referees or the gatekeepers are not necessarily friendly to the, to the, uh, to the subject matter, to the, to the, to the discipline. Um, you know, we have, for example, a, a chapter um, on Ambedkar as a philosopher, and you'll get a remark from a referee. Can we consider Ambedkar as a philosopher when he had no academic uh, qualifications? So you you know you get this kind of 
uh, a response as one always gets in, in public when giving talks, but surprisingly you get them through the peer referee uh, process. So this is one thing. Uh, one is there's always gonna be a, some uh, compromise in academic publishing in, in, in the pursuit of the profession. Uh, because we're dealing in, a, in an environment that has uh, not largely been overtaken by Ambedkarite egalitarian uh, ideas. The second is something that, in spite of that, I'm particularly uh, proud of with these five volumes, is that um, each of them has uh, work by young uh, Dalit uh, auth authors, both uh, uh, male and female. And while this seems like it wouldn't be, a, uh, normally it wouldn't be a big deal, you would be surprised how, how difficult it is because a conservative press like Oxford University Press first only wants to publish work by established authors. Second is not necessarily friendly to, uh, to Dalit authors. I'm not picking on Oxford University Press, I mean academic, orthodox academic presses in general. Um, and, uh, and third has certain standards that uh, are, are unvariable. So uh, getting young uh, Dalit authors in every volume, I think was a, was a great uh, achievement. And to see these young Dalit authors alongside um, uh, internationally renowned uh, scholars is is more or less the thing that keeps me quite happy with um, with this uh, set, irrespective of all of the compromises that we all have to make when when working in uh, in academic publishing. So um, I, I hope that wasn't a very weird uh, uh, intervention, but uh, um, you know now I'm retired, so. It's going to be more and more like this whenever you hear me speak. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think I think um, what you've said about the politics of knowledge, right? So there's a question of reading and interpretation, but I think you're also speaking to a, um, you know, the question of how does one amplify many of these concerns and these modes of thinking and critical intervention. But you're speaking to a kind of institutional world um, within which. Um, you need to make yourself legible, if I can put it that way. I guess when I come back to you, my um, question to you would be, uh, you know, all of these five volumes share the term justice and you've had to kind of, you know, qualify them by saying, you know, political justice and social justice and so on. But that question and that fundamental problem of justice, it seems to me, if I was to say, you know, what's the kind of approach or what's the key word, let's just say in terms of uh, thinking through modes of uh, doing intellectual history or political philosophy and so on. So if, you know, if that's the organizing word, what kind of work then for you, um, Akash Rathor, does, you know, justice do? Um, what's the work that that's doing in the way that this is framing Ambedkar's thought. But please hold my question and that thought. I'm going to move to Suraj um, very quickly and, and ask Suraj if you could say a little bit as well uh, about, uh, about the radical in Ambedkar. Thank you so much, Anu, and uh, thank you to ACLS, Sarah, and all the colleagues. It's always good to be back uh, in this audience and, and share and grow intellectually. Uh, it's almost has become synonymous to like an outpost of a certain intellectual thought when it comes to Ambedkar. And I think that's a good spot to have. And Anu, congratulations to you and many other colleagues who are feeling. That's a good uh, in, honor to, to, to have you say that. Thank you. Um, I want to just compliment on Akash's hair. I didn't know that, uh, you know, uh, his retirement kind of grows you in different directions, not least from the head. And I think that's, a, that's are you a, are you retired? So that... <laughs> I mean, you you are just <laughs> I just want to appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I want to I want to reiterate so many things that Akash so succinctly you know pointed out to, and also bring in some of the intellectual discourses. So one of the things we uh, face, or rather, stare, is this uh, is this chamber of denouncing, um, where, where, where Ambedkar is yet to be quote unquote qualified 
as an intellectual. It's usually people who think about Ambedkar or the people like us who write about Ambedkar are not given uh, the stature of somebody who is producing a intellectually uh, potent scholarship, uh, no matter uh, what uh, that entails too. Um, <clears throat> and I've been always thinking, what does this mean? It's usually a Dalit academic has to live within these two polar dimensions, either be a public commentator or two, uh, being somebody who just does a very um, esoteric, inaccessible work. I think this is uh, this is uh, this has really uh, given a very unfair uh, uh, analysis of of the Dalit scholarship when it comes to Ambedkar. Now, the reason you know uh, when we were putting, I mean, I just remember this, and I want to really uh, uh, give a shout out to India's, uh, according to me, most provocative and sincere intellectual currently, Anand Tiltumde. Who is linguist in prison? And and when I so when I when I thought about doing something on Ambedkar, I was I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, doing minding my business. But then we saw the RSS and BJP has had a program, uh, you know, commemorating Ambedkar, and they had a really straight out plans. And that was a very a, a very um, unwelcoming uh, for some of us who saw that. Uh, maybe Ambedkar's uh, halo that that has been given to his 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 followers might really turn out into something more sinister and it might even used against uh, himself and his followers as well. One of the primary concerns I had was about the critical assessment of Ambedkar scholarship. Now what I was doing is I wanted to not only uh, look at Ambedkar but critically assess. Now that's the second stage. The first stage is to really emphasize the existence of Ambedkar scholarship, right? And and so it really uh, was a, a, a canonical uh, trouble uh, for me. And, and so when I was thinking about it, I just thought the only person who could perhaps jive with me on this is Anand Tildumde. And, 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 and when, I, when I made a reach and I just did a kind of a uh, mail out of the blue and then, you know, Anand was his, his, at his own bits and, you know, he said he would not, you know, he wants something concrete, he would not deal with any slack. And then, you know, I kind of said, you know, why don't we just dive critically and I was thinking this through the critical appraisal of Du Bois's work that was done by African American intellectuals themselves. You know, uh, the kind of uh, appreciation, but also the critique uh, that Du Boisian theories. You know, they go in multiple direction. Not one of famous is the double consciousness. And a paper I read, which was a, not a paper, like a two papers at least I read that were taking Du Bois not least into this phenomenological aspect of double consciousness, but it really took into, let's say, education as a field. And, 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 and there was this critique of how do we uh, tackle uh, this, this program. And, and so we, I wanted, like, if, if there was a possibility of intervening in, in this case. And, and so the first process was to historicize Ambedkar. Uh, <clears throat> now, the historicizing that has happened outside Maharashtra is mostly historicizing in English language. Uh, within the Marathi uh, uh, public sphere, there is a continuing uh, a process. It's, it's not yet attended to. And that's why, you know, for us, uh, when we approach the question of Dalit through Ambedkar, it's a processual uh, condition. It is not a settled condition. And that's why it's very difficult for people to point a finger and anchor Ambedkar, unlike Marx. And that's why we uh, we compare him to Marx uh, for, for different reasons. My personal interest was, of course, Gramsci, you know, how Gramsci himself a sincere critique of, of Marx, um, um, matures Marxism to a certain level. And I know, I mean, your essay itself really foregrounds the Dalit question within this global politics, but as well as the Dalit as a category. And, and within that, <clears throat> excuse me, dimensions, uh, what we would like, we wanted to uh, look at was how Ambedkar really evolves and, and the reason Ambedkar is evolving is because Ambedkar is dealing with the tools that are evolving. And, and unlike Marx, where historical mater, uh, materialism is his primary contribution of others, but that re remains his focal point, Ambedkar is not giving you just one to chew on because he is dealing with an extremely complex society that each epoch produced different theories of what he calls revolution or in this case, counter-revolution. And, and, and his centralizing uh, feature is Brahminism, but Brahminism is, has, is, is not bereft with the material conflicts that it comes with, not just ritual. And so Ambedkar is very unique in that, that he gives 
in angle of a class dimension. In, in today's language, we might really call class and then it might really disturb many people, but we really need to understand how class is constructed in Ambedkar's, uh, Ambedkar's uh, opus, uh, which has a much more pragmatic reading of, of class. And you know, many of my colleagues here who are in the attendance have been working and thinking about, about Ambedkar. And then the question of minority. Now that's one of the most contested uh, features and minority as a minoritization, minoritization as inferiorization is a process that political class has enjoyed. And in this political class was this neo-Brahmin, neo-Shudra, neo-Baniya uh, uh, classes, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, really trying to work with the post-independent Congress regime. And, and we know when Ambedkar died, uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru government didn't even offer its monetary support for his dead body to be carried from Delhi to Bombay. It was it had to be raised from the scheduled caste trust fund. And this is a very known, notable history. And there was no, uh, what we have today, about 2 million people gathering in Bombay at Chaitya Bhumi uh, on, on 6 December to commemorate uh, uh, his death anniversary each year, which is basically a festival of intellectual exchange and a maturity of one's, uh, one's presence as a Dalit or non-Dalit into the world of humanity uh, that, we, that we navigate through without compass and without directions. That's the kind of space that it is, which doesn't really work within the enigma of uh, located hierarchies, but these are fluid hierarchies where the different class, different caste, different subcaste really gather under this one uno person. And, and so one of the fears was if this one uno person becomes co-opted, then there is a very difficulty because again, if, if Moses gets co-opted for wrong reasons, what would his followers do, which, which really fortunately uh, didn't happen with Moses, but we have a fear that this could be repeated in this case. And that's why we wanted to offer a strong uh, defense uh, to, to, to this kind of appropriation. But, 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 we but it turned out the exercise we were aiming for was probably a, a result for next generation because this generation scholarship is yet to come to terms with. Uh, the, the scholarship of Ambedkar, like Akash was saying, I am on a uh, uh, reviews when it comes to Dalit topics uh, with OUP, and 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 I was I was I was one of those reviewers of a very fat book that came out, and I was I was one of the uh, uh, disappointing uh, uh, um, aspects of that was uh, the commissioning editor. Uh, we're just trying to push out a scholarship on Ambedkar because a it has a very good currency, but the appropriators of that was never addressed. Question and I asked, who are these people? <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't really satisfy my uh, desire. And when I was told, I said, I mean, do you see how much of a big problem it is creating? And and so what Akash was saying is, we do not have enough uh, uh, Dalit scholars, and that's why we have this gatekeeping, and then. What I told them is, let me edit a, or, or let me help you bring more Dalit scholarship. There are fantastic PhDs and fantastic scholars. Let us publish them. Let us put through this process. At least 10 books should be published. And we made a proposal and all. The reviewer condescendingly said, you are too young to do a, a, a series edit, um, which it doesn't matter to me. There are a few other publishers in line with me because of the uh, stature that I have had. But I was thinking about all the other people who have had this intimidating uh, uh, presence. And that also made me realize that Ambedkar can be first dealt with it, but the people who work on Ambedkar, especially Dalits, are not given the credit of being intellectuals. They are still reduced to the idea, and I'm not saying in a, den uh, in a denigrating way, but there is a tone in that where Ambedkar uh, writing Ambedkar speaking Dalit scholar is always reduced to a certain secondary status of, a, of, a, of an intellectual uh, uh, that I have noticed. And it, I'm, I'm one of the subjects of, of that. Uh, that doesn't deter us because the project of Ambedkar is a project that his ancestors and our ancestors have been carrying on. So it's, it's much more also a political project. And, and I'll, I'll end with this uh, uh, contemporaneity of Ambedkar, or rather I welcome this uh, critical Ambedkar scholarship uh, or studies that has been uh, put on the table, <clears throat> I think uh, there are two fears uh, that go with this. 
as much as the project we will try to uh, visualize. Uh, the, the first is um, that Ambedkar as a scholarship, does it provide a pragmatic response to the Dalit question? Now, many of our Ambedkar loving non-Dalit friends have come from the uh, direction of the Western liberalism or radicalism. Most often the left thought or, or the thought of homegrown Gandhian uh, principality. Now that all this new or erstwhile fiefdoms of intellectual uh, conservatories are now really becoming uh, exhausted, Ambedkar is coming out in his much more swagger, not least because of his style, but also because how he how he deploys his canon and he's unafraid. And so people, Dalits like me and many others who draw this inspiration, we, we, we need to we need to essentialize that that experience is not uh, 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 unduly taken uh, by someone else, and, and I think that's that's the that's one of the fear. And and the second is is more a question of uh, intellectual uh, 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 program of the twenty first century that I'm personally concerned with as to how we draw more inferences, more logical conclusions, or or logical relations with other intellectuals. Fanon, for example, in this case, uh, really gets picked up for rightful reason. Of course, his critique is uh, colonialism and colonialism was a big purchase uh, some time ago. Now it is losing its purchase because as every time goes, this is a new epoch, it has a new questions. Ambedkar, I think, was dealing with the questions of this era. That, that's why we have had to skip a generation that really built uh, with its uh, enormous sacrifices, and I'm talking about intellectuals, uh, where now the political patronage of 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 these governments and celebrating an entire year is coming uh, is coming to them just by not making much efforts, right? Be it Karnataka government, be it Maharashtra government, be it central government, be it Delhi government, or the governments across are getting a free accessible uh, Ambedkar, and the Dalits who labor for Ambedkar. But to construct that has been an entire generation that was languished in prison. And we know Dada Sahib Gaikwad's movement, who were, where people landlessly marched, was there. And then we have Dalit Panthers and also those Dalits who went to left movement. These were the people, I think, that needs to have a public memory and archive, without which an Ambedkar or Ambedkarite thinking will really not mature. Feno gets the credit, Gramsci gets the credit, Ambedkar is also get the getting the credit, but certainly for reasons that are not reducible uh, to, to, to what we call the fragments of colonial politics. Ambedkar was really not, that was not really his vision. He was vision was much more uh, sincere and much more uh, broader. And when I say he was sincere, I don't mean to say anyone else's was not insincere. What I mean to say is he was just devoted to the project of humanity and the quality of humanity uh, for, for this era. And I think that's why uh, we find in him uh, this this figure. I think uh, uh, that remains the call of action. Thanks, Suraj. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, both kind of push on something that I think you ended with that there are and and try to sort of work backwards in some sense to think about um, some of the main points I think uh, you've made. Um, so so the question of you know who comes to Ambedkar and how and under what circumstances and here we're thinking I think intellectual um, circumstances so let's leave the question of access the politics of knowledge the university the institution aside just for a second but you know the the idea that there's been a kind of exhaustion with either thinking through you know the non-liberal Gandhi or that you know we have kind of you know gone through the gamut of our anti-colonial thinkers um, and and uh, adopted whatever set of perspectives we may have on them, but that you know this this remark that you made that there is a kind of saturation of that mode of thinking, and so there is a way in which we approach Gandhi intellectually at the end of a process of thinking and engaging other thinkers. And counterposing to that, your argument that there is a different kind of an archive, and I think you began with that as well, that there's a different kind of an archive, there's a different archive of both historical and cultural memory. And certainly for those of us who work in Marathi, we know that there has been a long standing yeah. um, effort both to create um, archives that are by no means centralized, much of this is, is popular. It has been undertaken by people at enormous personal cost and sacrifice, as you say, but that there has been 
perhaps uh, many Ambedkars that one has been dealing with and, and working yeah. through, um, albeit, you know, and I will suggest to you that there's also been a certain kind of deification and iconization of Ambedkar, which is, which is troubling and problematic. But there are also, again, political reasons for that, you might say, right? So there's a kind of mimetic relationship between the absence and the deification, one might say, that's, that's ongoing. But, you know, you're posing some really, it seems to me, returning to the question of sort of the archive and reading, you're posing a kind of question of, of reading, right? Who is Ambedkar for? And with what kind of an archive does one approach Ambedkar's thought? I think this is where you ended with the question of, of a possible critique of Ambedkar. Um, the second issue that you bring up um, is, it seems to me, or there are two other issues that you bring up. Um, one, in the Radical and Ambedkar, you bring up the question of historical comparison. And you talked about Du Bois, but I think the Radical and Ambedkar opens up the space for thinking about race and caste. Yeah. Right? And that that becomes the kind of arc you talked about Fanon, you talked about Du Bois, but in some sense, broadly speaking, uh, black and kind of diasporic African, you know, thinking um, becomes, it seems to me, the kind of logical uh, complement to the ways that you're suggesting we think about reading on Bitcoin globally. And I want to ask you a little bit more about that. You know, why? What are the stakes of that? Certainly, one can think about the. Uh, the, the, the claims that, that Du Bois makes for uh, universality, which is very similar to Ambedkar's, right? So yeah. the point there is, yes, we can do universal history. Yes, I can think about the enlightenment. Yes, I can uh, you know, talk about Roman history and so on, because this is precisely the kind of training that I have made sure to get, right? So that I can be on the same playing field. So mm -hmm. that claim to thought as such, which I think we see with both a Du Bois and an Ambedkar and certainly a Fanon, you know, I wonder what you make of that arc of historical comparison. What does that global arc um, have to do or how does that sit with the deeply regional and local uh, kind of work that you're also suggesting needs to be done? So in a sense, you know, we seem to be thinking both deeply locally and globally and forgetting in a sense about the, the nation and the nation form. So we're sort of, you know, beneath the radar and kind of outside that space itself. So is that um, the approach or is that a workable uh, way to think about uh, how to read Ambedkar, right? Um, I guess is what I'd ask you. The third, and this will get me back hopefully also to, to um, Akash and I'll say some things as well along the way. Um, but the third, it seems to me, is the question of, of the keyword. So I asked Akash about the keyword of, of justice, something that seems to animate and organize the volumes, but something that he himself has been committed to and has spoken and written about uh, in his own work quite widely and extensively. Um, you bring up the question of Brahmanism. And I think of that as a, as a, as a kind of a double helix structure. And this is something that Ambedkar already in Cast in India, which is what I'm writing about and want to say something about, is already thinking about the complex historicity of caste, right? Is, is that, you know, it doesn't have the kind of temporal, uh, either the developmental arc that we might see for an argument about, you know, capital and so forth. You spoke about Marx. Uh, we neither have that, uh, nor mm. are we really able to, you know, stabilize this kind of schizophrenic ways in which Brahmanism operates as also a kind of structure of, of, uh, of desire, not just of social and political power. So is Brahmanism the kind of key word? Does it put pressure then on the theoretical uh, engagements with uh, Marxism, with heterodox Marxism, with Gramsci? Uh, so, I mean, you know, I'm trying to pin you both down. I'm saying, you know, give me a theory, give me a theorist um, so that so that we can uh, we can have a kind of, you know, conversation and an argument. What is the key word through which you would approach Ambedkar, an impossible reading of Ambedkar? Setting aside, I think, the, the, the really complicated questions of uh, institution, politics, access, uh, indeed, what Gopal Guru has uh, in that kind of stunning remark of his uh, called, you know, uh, theoretical Brahmins and empirical Shudras, right? That that 
divide of intellectual and manual labor continues to haunt us. But if we set aside the institution as such, and if I was to push each of you to give me a kind of reading of a baker that you'd like to see, what would that be? Right. Sure, okay. sure. Please, yeah. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yeah, please, please. So I think just starting at, at the beginning, this idea of, of, uh, of justice, uh, I, there's a sense in which uh, justice and, and uh, Brahminism are, are uh, opposites. Uh, justice is articulated so there, there, there are two things. One is that Dr. Mitka was was often very finicky about uh, definitions of words, especially concepts that were quite close to him: equality, uh, fraternity, as I talk about in the in the preamble book. What I also mention in the preamble book is that, ironically, justice was one of the words about which he was very. Uh, uh, relaxed in some respects. It, there was a point at which he said that justice is nothing other than democracy. There was a point in riddles uh, where he says that democracy is nothing but liberty, equality, and fraternity. And then there's another point in a later speech where he says that liberty, equality, and fraternity are nothing but justice. <laughs> so there's a um, uh, realizing that that there was a certain sense within which Ambedkar saw what I, I liked very much how Suraj ended in his vision. Um, uh, it, was a, it, it was quintessentially a, a, a just vision or a vision for, for justice. That, that is more or less where Ambedkar begins uh, in castes, uh, in the castes paper, and where he ends in 1956 in his final uh, speech uh, a couple of weeks before he died. It is all about uh, all about uh, justice in the sense of um, uh, treating uh, like situations in like ways. You know, classical definition of justice. Now, uh, Brahminism is is precisely that ideology that treats like in unlike ways. Right, graded inequality uh, demands uh, taking. Uh, uh, two uh, human persons in identical uh, objective circumstances and treating them uh, according to a differential that is uh, ideological and not um, uh, not uh, uh, material. So, uh, so justice and Brahminism are are are, are you know are, are very uh, intimately related uh, concepts, and I don't think that one. I mean what. The pursuit of justice is the overcoming of Brahminism. So there's, uh, there's, uh, I, I mean, not merely Brahminism, but as an essential condition. So there's a there's a very intimate relationship between, between the two. When later we talk about um, uh, periodization of uh, Dr. Ambedkar, I think this is quite uh, significant because as I'm waiting to hear you uh, uh, speak about your work on, on, on caste in India. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit revolution and counter-revolution in ancient India, his, his last work, which uh, strangely, I think everybody knows that Ambedkar delayed the um, republishing uh, annihilation of caste because he wanted to incorporate uh, caste in India uh, into it. So you can see a, a continuity from for 20 years there up to 1936, but then uh, even in 1942, he was still considering republishing caste in India. It turns out uh, in 1946 and 1948, in both the Shudras and the Untouchables book, uh, Ambedkar makes some changes to his conceptions from caste in India, but in 1956, in Revolution and Counter-Revolution, he not only denies uh, some of the remarks that he made in 46 and 48, especially about Ary Aryan migration, but he uh, evokes once again what he had written in Cass in India. So, um, and the reason that I'm bringing this up 
prematurely <laughs> before we're going to discuss that is because in every case, what is being discussed here is the idea of Brahminism. Uh, Brahminism as uh, in relation to justice, that is to treat uh, like uh, uh, things in an unlike way um, or uh, to treat the unlike uh, in a like way, you know, Ambedkar makes that remark that you you cannot have a, um, uh, an ignorant Brahmin by definition post uh, Manu. So this is you know the Brahminical counter revolution um, that uh, uh, whereas earlier uh, Brahmins should be separated according to whether they know something uh, following uh, uh, following the Manushmati, you you could no longer have an ignorant uh, Brahmin. So. Um, so you treat the like in an unlike way and you treat the unlike in a, in a like way. Both things are the, by definition, the opposite of, of, uh, of uh, what Amitra understands by justice, to treat the like uh, like. So uh, throughout his life, he was preoccupied with uh, justice and with the, um, it's gr the, the greatest impediment that he, he knew of uh, to justice um, in India, which was which was uh, Brahminism, or more specifically, uh, Brahminical patriarchy. So, uh, so I hope I, I I sort of answered two things at once. Why I organized the five volumes um, of Ambedkar um, according to each of these sort of domains of uh, of justice, because each of them has this double prong of of uh, a concern for egalitarian egal liberty or, or equal liberty and, uh, and the overcoming or the annihilation of, of, uh, of Brahminism um, and, uh, and the relationship between these two concepts, which I think are two very central concepts uh, in Ambedkar's, not necessarily thought because he was somewhat ambiguous about the meaning of the term justice, but in his uh, vision, as, as Suraj put it, um, uh, it, it was, it was a life more or less under a, a hypnotic uh, obsession with uh, with achieving uh, achieving justice in India. You can see that in every one of his, his writings. Thanks, Akash. Um, Suraj. So I, I think um, this really complements to some of the points that uh, I'm also going to kind of repeat almost. Uh, see. The, the, the essentializing of certain metaphors that were liberal in character by Ambedkar really provides him a stature of somebody who could be, uh, who could have a conversation with people beyond Indian boundaries. Uh, and in many ways, uh, uh, people uh, read also Ambedkar uh, um, as, as a liberal thinker uh, because of his treatment uh, with the idea of polity uh, representation, and then his call uh, for special status of the underrepresented. And we know that through uh, the his recoining of the term minority, which was not necessarily only demographic or, or, or number-based game, but it was also about expression and history. And I think in, 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 in that uh, process, what Ambedkar also does is he matures an extremely complex democracy that he has also observed that was not really known to India since the time of Buddha, where he also talks about the republics that were existing. But in many ways, India was really immune uh, to democracy. Uh, we didn't really know how functions of democracy operate, let alone the political character of democracy, democracy as a societal exchange, as an ethic, as a political philosophy. That was absent. And I think that's why Ambedkar is so concerned with democracy. And that's why the predecessing, my predecessing predecessor or the scholars of the previous generation that Anu, you in your introductory remark pointed out to, uh, worked with the idea of democracy in Ambedkar so closely. And, 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 and many a times, Ambedkar's vision, and as you can see in the radical in Ambedkar as well, you are right, it is about creating this global conversation and connecting the dots. I'm more concerned, I've always told the archive of the future. And, and for that to happen, some of these works needs to be, and that's why you have a chapter on Jews. You have, we have, we have a couple more chapters on African-Americans. Then there is also an interest in the uh, former Soviet forms of, of revolutions that works. And, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a laboratory 
of, of on, on Ambedkar's thought and, and invite various experts to uh, do their own independent autonomous tests uh, without any uh, you know, uh, limitations, bring your disciplinary toolkits and, and, and deal with the topics. Now, many times the peer reviewers whom we shared the papers were sometimes not really happy with the contributions, but then we, 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 we had to, of course, push back. Some papers we just had to deny. I don't want to name of the people who had to deny, but it was really uh, uh, offering a uh, performance for for Ambedkar, right? And 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 what Akash was talking about through the through the through the ginormous investment in justice, uh, you know, uh, where where we really need to understand this as a uh, political ethics that Ambedkar is dealing with. He's, he's a very morally concerned human being, and for that uh, there has to be certain ways of of tale telling of the community he deals with, and that's why Brahminism. Uh, is, is is so essential. I mean, you know, he is he is, and he, he and and one of the things, if if one reads history sincerely, ancient history, ancient Indian history, uh, w- what one sees is that Ambedkar is a, a a person relevant to South Asian archives. You know, we we can deal with his uh, uh, conversations, uh, his debates, his contribution uh, for a South Asian public sphere. Uh, you can talk about that in the question of Sri Lanka, Nepal is, is, a, is a parent, Afghanistan and, 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 and Pakistan and, and so forth. The reason being, <clears throat> Ambedkar also has investment in this uh, global uh, materiality of the Dalit condition. And, and in this case, the Dalit is not only the Dalit of India, but Dalit of around the world, like the, the people who have been receiving at the receiving end. And so we need to really make uh, the, the 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 flexibility, and eventually, you know, he just ended up making uh, his focus scheduled caste, which was very India centric, which was very much a uh, 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 programmatic alliance, and an eventual culmination, we which unfortunately could not see was the republicanism, the United States of India that he was he was foreseeing, where he had uh, found potential allyship in America more fruitful than the ideology based unhelpful alliance for a country like India. And, and that's what I've been also yeah, thinking about the, 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 the productivity of Ambedkar uh, when it comes to zeroing in on, on a concept uh, which is old, which is ancient, but remains so prevalent, which is Brahminism. Why would Ambedkar deal with a concept that would not offer him a necessary advantage? If Ambedkar uh, would have just worked uh, with a fashionable terms and, and, and concepts, which he was very much able to, uh, he 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 doesn't do it. I mean, he might as well write a treatise on colonialism. He might as well write a treatise uh, on on Marx, which he was meant to write as well. But his primary focus, if he had to become that person, that would have become uh, you know uh, the Marxist bemoaned him when he refused to sign the Pune Pact, uh, the 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 Global Marxist Journal. Uh, I'm I'm forgetting the name. Uh, they they lashed him out. They said uh, you know he's acting like a bourgeois. And this was the same narrative that was peddled by the Brahmin communist or the dominant caste the communists. So what happens is Ambedkar is not only dealing with historical injustice, but it is also dealing with present injustice. And, and it is a very difficult position for one to then carve out a niche, which is honest and which is not reductive, which is not reactionary and, and provide a very uh, solid, fertile scholarship upon which movements uh, and an and intellectual process can begin. And, and so what, one could do theoretically is uh, not only deal with those few keywords or concepts, but also deal with the processual uh, aspirations of Ambedkar. What that means is that Ambedkar is not really committed to uh, uh, one uh, house or, 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 or one destination. He has multiple destinations and those destinations could be wherever there is a liberation, freedom, and respect for his people. Eventually, of course, when he becomes part of Constituent Assembly of India, he thinks of his question in, in, in a broader terms. But we should not forget, Ambedkar was also somebody who was thinking that maybe there is a separate land for Dalits. Maybe we'll have a separate nation for Dalits. Why not? He said, I mean, and you know, his, whole, his whole idea of separate, uh, separate settlement is basically a, a, a blueprint for what would it mean? He wanted to threaten. And we can see Gandhi and the elites realized that 
the best way to uh, make the country work was to co-opt Dalits. Because if there is no acceptance of Dalit in the project of Indian nation, it will not function. And how do we do that? And this is Tel Tumde's argument that uh, it was meant to be a constitutionalism that was meant to be taken, but not the constitutional morality, which is basically challenging the caste, which found its way into directive principles, not fundamental rights, is where we can see uh, this uh, complicated position. And, and that's why, you know, in, in, I mean, Akash is also writing the, the, the uh, biography of Ambedkar, and, and so am I. And uh, I, 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 I wanted to say that I could swim through his childhood and all, but when it comes to his public uh, persona, 1990, when 1919, and you know, he's the South Borough Commission onwards, it's just a very thick scholarship. And we really need an itemized, proper, solid exposition of those each year or even decades. Because reverence, and this is what happened. This is, um, I, I told a monk, a Buddhist monk, that uh, monk, uh, our people are, are, are just uh, deifying Ambedkar instead of uh, following uh, or, or instead of critically examining. And then the monk gave me a very uh, a Buddhist answer. He said, you know, uh, people uh, have various ways of looking at Ambedkar. If they want to deify, let them deify. And you want to look at a critical aspect of it, you look at it. And I think so. And, and I think there are no contradictions in that. If there is a, there is a corpus of deifying and there is a purpose for that. If it is achieving the purpose, let it be. But also there is another aspect that some of us need to be concerned about, and I think I'll rather put myself into, into, into critically uh, dealing with Ambedkar's scholarship, uh, uh, with, with not, no, I don't want to go the salacious interpretation of Ambedkar, but his pure thought uh, in, 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 his, in his times. Just a couple of things, and then I wanted to read a question. Uh, we just have two, but one of the, one of them is a is a question that I think might be relevant for continuing the conversation. But I think two things sort of coming out here is uh, you know the idea of the archive of the future, uh, which you bring up, uh, Suraj, and then I think the question of of uh, history. Let me be a historian just for a, a moment as well. That. You know this question of Brahmanism, and I, I would like to come back to this because this is both the 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 the, the great um, node around which I think Ambedkar does something quite distinctive. And I'll go back to the Kas in India all the way through to the final text, uh, Revolution and Counter Revolution, that this focus on Brahmanism is something that he kind of develops as precisely a kind of you know um, a structuring structure um, as a ideology that connects um, his deep uh, questioning of, of the millennial past, of the Indian past, right? And Ambedkar as a historian uh, and Brahmanism, I think are, are connected in a very, very interesting way. And it of course brings him to uh, the two ways in which he approaches Buddhism both as kind of emancipatory, but Buddhism also as historical, right? Really existing and, and as a historical social form. Um, and then there's the question of the future uh, that you've put forward, um, Suraj, which is, you know, who can Ambedkar be for us? Meaning, you know, broadly a kind of global public and so on. And I, I wonder if there's a kind of dissonance between those two modes yeah. of approaching Ambedkar, one. Two, coming back to the question of Brahmanism, this I think is where some amount of historicizing is, is worthwhile, even in terms of the, 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 the concept. Because of course, Brahmanism, and if we go back and think about the long tradition of anti-caste thought in Western India, Brahmanism is of course what Fule develops um, in, in, in uh, a kind of quite extraordinary way. Uh, but, but it becomes part of a kind of playlist, if you will, for the Satyashodak movement and beyond, right? So the idea of Brahmins versus Hindus, which is something that the later Satyashodak and political non-Brahmanism begins to kind of open up. What are the two histories, right? That we've got Brahmins and Hindus, but this, this idea that Brahmanism has a kind of long history of thinking behind it. I would just like to put forward, I mean, I think, yes, Ambedkar yeah. does something quite innovative and that's you know why it's worth going back and thinking about caste in India. But I think Brahmanism, the term, has a very particular focus in Western India in anti-caste thought. Brahmanism also in the Tamil country becomes the focus of a, a very specific form of thinking, 
right? And I just wanted to kind of, you know, point to that. But what I wanted to also pick up on, one of the questions here that was asked in the Q&A is someone sort of asking, and maybe our conversation reflects what they had in mind behind the question. But uh, Rama Ganeshan says, I'd like to ask, what is critical Ambedkar studies exactly? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in finding out if Dr. Ambedkar was correct in some of his important statements. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, why people became untouchable or whether indeed the history of ancient India is a battle between Buddhism and Brahmanism. Um, even the book that came out, The Brahmins and Broken Men, which is kind of extracts, I think, from uh, the 48 text, doesn't address the first question critically, uh, as in it does not evaluate alternative explanations. Um, and, uh, and, and again, maybe the, the second question here too, in terms of interdisciplinary contributions, what are the dimensions of Ambedkar's work that are most understudied? My hunch is that these include his Buddhist hermeneutics, Absolutely. but he has not been taken seriously enough by the field of Buddhist studies, dis despite a few scattered enthusiasts. Do you have thoughts on this? So if I may um, use the political the theology term, but just suggest that there is a kind of Buddhism, Brahmanism, the ancient Indian past set of conversations that Ambedkar opens up. And then secondly, drawing on the question of historical comparison, race and caste, that the Dalit becomes in a sense, the horizon for thinking a possible political future. I'll just, this is just a, um, a kind of artificial divide or a separation that I, that I wanted to put forward. But I'd also like to ask if we make that divide, can we return to something that Akash was, uh, was mentioning? Uh, how we read the later works, which are actually the historical works, right? The 46, uh, who are the Shudras, the untouchables, revolution, counter-revolution, and the recursive way in which Ambedkar returns to caste in India. Uh, very, very interesting because he's, you know, 25. He's, uh, I think at the time that he writes caste in India, he is using a, a number of different concepts and he's kind of playing with them. Suraj, you use the term laboratory. I think he's playing with them in ways that they don't actually cohere, but they do produce a very, very interesting and novel mode of thinking. Um, about the question of, of caste, its relationship to race already, and this, uh, this, this thing that is going to preoccupy him from there on out, uh, what we mean by Brahmanism as a particular mode uh, and operation of social, political, and kind of ideological power. So where, which side of this would either of you want to take up? Uh, Akash, I'm very interested in your coming back to the later texts, the historical texts, and, and what we might do with those. Yeah, I, I think I mean, this is really, really fascinating. A, a, any one of us who studies Ambedkar um, has this question about periodizing Ambedkar. Uh, um, so I see it as there are continuities and there are discontinuities. I don't think it's as easy as an early and a late as you find with Heidegger or Wittgenstein or two common uh, 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 significant 20th century characters that have a very definite early and, and, and late. I don't s see that that's there with, uh, with Ambitka, but there are, there are very distinct discontinuities. Um, what's fascinating is, so there's one thing I want to say, uh, 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 Anu, this is probably one of my favorite topics, so just tell me when to shut up if I don't control myself. You had mentioned two ways of seeing um, uh, uh, Ambedkar has two ways of, of seeing or presenting uh, Buddhism as emancipatory and as historical. So there's, to bring in the scariest historiographer that I know, Hegel, you know that in the way that Hegel sees history, these, these two separate things, the, um, the emancipatory and the, and the historical, in Hegel's term, there would be uh, the historical and, and the you know, salvation. Um, uh, through history, these merge and at the end of history are the same. And I think there's no denying that the same, that Ambedkar draws the same conclusion. Uh, so there, this is what we see with, with revolution and counter-revolution 
Um, and the way that this text relates back to so many of his earlier writings, including people, ones that people don't pay attention to, like his foreword to uh, Narasu's uh, uh, Buddhism text, so on. Um, so there's a clear sense within which Ambedkar it discovered uh, uh, Buddhism was influenced, inspired by it. I mean, you should, not you, uh, both of you, but one should uh, keep in mind very old fragments like ancient Indian commerce, probably his first attempt at his Columbia University MA thesis, is, is completely packed with information about, uh, about uh, uh, Buddhist polity. And uh, this, he, uh, Ambedkar drops this, this is from the, from, the, from, the, from the teens, he drops this all the way up until 1949. You know, there's, when Ambedkar spoke to the Constituent Assembly uh, presenting the draft constitution for the first time, for the first reading in, on November 4th, um, he was attacked because there was what, what was called nothing of ancient Indian polity in the draft constitution that he presented. And if you read the number, November 4 speech that Ambedkar gave, it's a brilliant speech. I mean, it's unbelievable, but you can see that he's a bit on the back foot uh, in replying to that uh, complaint. November, one year later, uh, in his 25th November uh, uh, speech, when he's handing the final uh, a draft of the constitution over for its adoption the next day. He gives a long speech on how the constitution relates to ancient Indian uh, polity. But what he's discovered in that year, and you, it, it, it amazes me that this is one year of time, 12 months, 13 months of time. What he, what he discovers or rediscovers in that year is that one doesn't have to, 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 to live under the hegemony that when we speak of ancient India, we mean Hindu India or Brahminical uh, India. So in that, in that period, he replies that this constitution and the Republic is packed full of symbols and procedures from ancient Indian polity, but it is not the ancient India that you think it is uh, uh, Buddhist practices, both in content from early Buddhist uh, democratic or parliament, uh, uh, republics, and it is uh, Buddhist in form from a, a, a parliamentary-like procedures practiced by the early Sangha. So, uh, so you see in the course of a year that Dr. Mitka returns back once again to uh, pick up uh, ideas of, uh, of the role of uh, Buddhism as a historical phenomenon in early India to set it up as a, um, as a model for the future of India how India ought to be. And that's the way that his, his final writings, revolution and counter-revolution, uh, take shape. We know that in early India, uh, there was this, um, uh, uh, s s uh, as the person in the, who asked the question uh, uh, mentioned, you know, there are two drafts of this. One state's mortal battle between Brahminism and Buddhism, and one state's moral battle between Brahminism and Buddhism, because it's it's a, in Ambedkar's ha uh, handwriting. So I don't know if it's a mortal battle or a moral battle between Brahminism and and, and Buddhism. But uh, you know, this was stated. This this claim was stated by uh, Buddhologists and uh, and uh, Indologists from uh, a century uh, before uh, uh, Ambedkar. In fact. You know, in one of the arguments for continuity, Dr. Mitter picked up in um, in New York a copy of uh, Miss Rise or Reese David's uh, Buddhism that's on the Pali uh, Canon. Um, I think it was published in 1912 or 1913, and then later, a decade later, so and he inscribes it uh, Varsity, Columbia Varsity, um, 1913, I believe. Then uh, a decade later, he he reinscribes it. Uh, uh, Bombay, India, which shows another decade of continuity. I mean, he's, he picks up this book in 1912, 1913. He picks it up again in 1923, and he reinscribes it when he's uh, uh, in, or 1924, in, in Bombay. 
So you have all of these moments where Dr. Ambedkar is going back to Buddhism, which is a historical, which he presents and is aware of as a historical phenomenon and all of the traditions of interpretations that, um, that support him. And he begins to use it, manipulate it, uh, uh, reconstruct it to become uh, an emancipatory uh, um, uh, and regulative uh, ideal or, or, or ideology. So it's a regulative ideal or ideology in the sense that uh, it offers um, ideals that, that we should aspire to, but may never uh, 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 achieve. Um, but it is the direction, I, I mean, you see it decade after decade, if we periodize um, Ambedkar, it is, it is the condition, it is the only condition that will ultimately allow, as Dr. Ambedkar sees in the 1950s, for what he demanded in the 1940s, which is constitutional morality. Because uh, to be very, uh, let's say, brusque about it, Ambedkar's position on this was- you like a minute um, you said I don't. I don't need it. This is my last line. I'm going down in flames with this one. Ambedkar's uh, uh, opinion was more or less that we will never manage to get Brahmins to to a stage where constitutional morality supplants Brahminism, unless uh, we uh, realize that the ideology of Brahminism gets itself supplanted by the egalitarian ideology and literature of, of Buddhism. And so later in revolution and counter-revolution, the function of uh, Buddhism, though it, it, it emerges as historical fact, is a regulative ideal and is the precondition for the operation or success of, uh, of the constitution as Dr. Ambedkar stated it repeatedly um, in the late 1940s. So, I mean, there's a lot going on with demanding a kind of continuity of Ambedkar's um, thought, despite, uh, uh, this, despite the clear uh, discontinuity in the, in the 1950s. No, I, th I, think, I think that's right. And I think there's this um, argument about the reiterative nature of his thought that he keeps returning to a problem, right? And he keeps returning to a problem with, and you know, sort of just talking about what do we do with 1919 and beyond with the South Borough Commission, and you know, the moment when he's most kind of publicly, politically active, you know, engaging the colonial state and being called a colonial stooge and so on and so forth. But that, you know, but but you know, there is there there's a way in which um, you know he keeps returning to a problem. It's it's like a squirrel with a nut or something, right? And he keeps worrying that problem. Because there is no satisfactory answer to the historical violence of Brahmanism, something that he sketches out in caste in India, as you know, where he says caste is endogamy, <laughs> and endogamy is fundamentally a structure of sexual violence and violation. Right? Either you're annihilated, i.e., you die <laughs> because you're surplus woman or you're kept in a state of continual, you know, kind of social death, right? Um, but that's, that's, those are the two ends, as it were, of, uh, um, of, 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 the, um, of the thinking that, that Ambedkar presents to us in that text. But there's a way in which he is profoundly concerned, it seems to me, and just to kind of humanize or personalize the Ambedkar that we're talking about, but there is a kind of question that he keeps returning to with, a kind of ferocity and an inability to get at the final answer to it. How could this be, right? And this is the question that he poses even in, in The Untouchables. He says, you know, this is about art, this is not history. I have to fill in the blanks because this doesn't exist. I've been invisibilized. <laughs> and yet I'm the active animating agent for the entire structure of the Indian historical. I don't exist, right? So, so that that recursive nature of the thought, and this is just to you know, um, I think to to kind of agree with you um, and the kind of reading that you're offering, Akash. But to suggest that I think that um, that way of perhaps thinking about the Ambedkar also uh, about Ambedkar begins to challenge uh, the early late distinction, if ever that made sense for anybody but that that's something that maybe one wants to really uh, take on board and think or engage in some way. Um, 
I will ask you then what role annihilation plays because annihilation typically has been thought of as that kind of text, the fulcrum that moves us from the one to the other, right? From the early to the late, almost like, you know, with Du Bois, the, with black reconstruction, we see a kind of shift from one kind of Du Bois to the other. So I wonder what role AOC plays uh, in, in Ambedkar's work. We've talked about the very early and the very late works. Uh, and then I will just open it up to Suraj because Suraj, you, you may uh, want to take issue with, uh, with this focus on Brahmanism, historical violence and uh, a reiterative uh, mode of reading and engaging um, Ambedkar in, in the archive. I mean, you know, um, I know you had a point before uh, you gave to Akash, I, 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 I kind of had a, something, if you remember, uh, uh, you had like two very interesting points, which I, I just picked up one, but anyway, I'll, I'll bring up and if it comes in conversation, but I would like to go back and, and check. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the analysis of Brahminism for Ambedkar uh, and, and when he then he eventually, of course, talks about Hindu, as, as a concept, which I, I found it, I find it still surprising that he still deals uh, with uh, that canon of thought. Now, uh, one of my uh, thought is because he's, there are two reasons for that. One is the archeological evidence is still uh, not, uh, not mature yet. It's not really uh, fruitful for Ambedkar to make any concrete uh, uh, you know, statements as he can. And that's why he's, he's serious hermeneutic reading of Buddha and as well as ancient India through Rigveda and other Sanskrit canons is really something spot on because he did not necessarily always rely on the translations and the interpreters of, of this. And, and as, as uh, Akash was talking about Rice Davids, you know, even in his book on Buddha, I think it was 1877, uh, there is an enormous, uh, so, so there has been skepticism about the, the, the literature and, and the focus on antiquity and historicity about this. There has been a huge debate, especially in the Buddhist studies even today, people kind of, uh, uh, there is much more un unattended, uh, unaddressed, uh, 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 unresolved, excuse me, uh, 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 tension there because of the inadequacy of Pali canon and as well as the kind of new revelations that, that come into focus. Now Ambedkar really is, uh, <clears throat> is, 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 is doing a literal analysis, right? And that literal analysis is, is something uh, that, that, that requires a creative apparatus uh, to, be, to be deployed to really uh, uncover uh, some of this. So Brahminism, as we also know, Gita and all other uh, texts uh, are, are, are sometimes claimed to be written by Shudras. And then Shudras in the sense of the evolving category of Shudras, not necessarily Shudras of today's time, but, 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 but this, this possibility of, of, of then being appropriated, because as you would know, uh, Alexander and Ashoka really displaced Brahmins, and it, some studies claim they even you know, wiped out Brahmins to, who were really in positions and wanted to replace with the uh, themselves kind of a. Uh, I don't think they identify themselves as Kshatriya, especially Ashoka. And after the Ashoka, the other invaders during after Mauryans, uh, there was really no categorical value to Brahmins. And so, the, how does Brahminism as a force rise? One one explanation is this Chanakya based. Uh, you know, Kautilya reading, but that is insufficient to really provide uh, this force that uh, that gathers, and and I think that is why uh, I have we have to read, and I've been doing that now, <clears throat> and I haven't to plug in something I've been trying to develop is Ashoka's India Initiative, where we would like to you know think about this Ambedkar's theorization of Buddhist past with that of Ashokan history. I mean, much of the literature that is now coming out is so revealing and so fascinating. Um, that uh, that foregrounds Ashokan history uh, as as as, uh, uh, as as a history of uh, Akash was pointing out to the mortal and moral, and I was thinking there is really no difference if you look through a historical trajectory of Brahminism and Buddhism. It is both, right? And and it is it is like some as emphasizing either off. And and in in that in that phase, what we see is Ambedkar's theorization. I don't know how many times he must have relying relied on. Ashoka as a figure, as a someone whose epigraphic notes or you know evidences that we have today, and that's what I'm saying. Like I, I wish there was a, a much more advancement and much more archaeological discoveries that would have put uh, Ambedkar's interest more you know uh, uh, in 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 line with Ashoka. But nevertheless, Ashoka is very much animating in his own uh, thought 
one of the things is the way he uh, that Akash also talked about, especially when it comes to chaperoning at the constitution and as well as <clears throat> uplifting some of those uh, examples. And, and one of that being uh, the, the, the state religion as, as, as something that, that was existing, which was, which was different in, in a different character. So I think this missing piece within this Buddhist canon as well as to the later texts that were added, or maybe it was there a possibility of any, any, any mixture. And, you know, there is this, um, uh, there is this um, kind of, uh, uh, within the Pali canon, we, we do not know uh, that uh, uh, if, if, if we have to talk about uh, a, a simple uh, history within the phases, uh, and, and with that we can see a Dalit history, is, is what I am arguing because Ashokan history is also about uh, the history of the Dalits who were not necessarily known as Dalits in there, but the but the but the but the lineage that Ambedkar gives to Buddha and, and you know it really has come across as a, a positive fortification of the of the, of the negative uh, or, or inferiorizing of, of of Dalit identity and and so 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 <clears throat> so there are probably two sources we need to see or consider to really a uh, pit Ambedkar's thesis of Brahminism. We need, we need to do annotations with, uh, I mean, Ambedkar certainly did with Pali, uh, you know, but also what about Sinhalese uh, 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 notations? How, how, how that uh, phasic uh, or, or reading of history attributes to what happens in with Buddha? Because there's so many, so many readings and that's why Ambedkar's, uh, we, we can call it injustice because people called it uh, 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 Ambedkar's Buddha as being socially something, something Buddha. I don't remember the exact word, but you know, uh, then there is a quest of this Nubayana Buddhism. Um, I'm, socially I'm, I'm, engaged. Socially, socially engaged, yes. And I think it's, it's, it's not just Ambedkar, there are also other Buddhist scholars in the East Asian field who have, who have, who have done the same, same job. Uh, but, but again, uh, you know, what 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 happens in, in and this is the risk right the the more pronounced buddhist values become adaptable to a non indian audience with its today mindfulness and other forms of uh, accessible buddhist uh, uh, mantras uh, uh, and, and if we don't have an ambedkarite perspective to that we really uh, we really face a major dilemma because the contradictions that Buddha is facing is what Ambedkar is amplifying in a much more refined, much more direct uh, form in, in a direct way. But if we, if you are unable to connect that work with that of uh, the the Buddha of two thousand five hundred years or or the or the following uh, phases within the Buddhist history, I think we really miss out an important link. And I think that's why Brahminism is not reduced to Brahmins, of course. Uh, but Ambedkar is seeing the process of how co-optation of Brahminical values become supplemented uh, within other, uh, you know, whichever regimes come, they become comfortable with it. Of all the reasons, the Rajputs, you know, who are, who are considered lower in, in many ways, immediately adopt a value of Brahminism to, to, to claim and yet have a despise to Brahmins. How do we solve that conflict? How do we how do we really deal with that? And Ambedkar's answer is there, right? Ambedkar is talking about, and he, even his theory of martial race theory, as you might have known, that he gives to the Dalits uh, who were initially martials, is basically trying to make the, the, the conversation intact that there were basically the classes. One were the Brahmins and one were the non-Brahmins. And that gets picked up in South India within the non-Brahmin unity uh, and, and, you know, fully bringing up eventual dissolution of this multiple castes into thousands of castes is 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 one can say is a recent phenomena considering ancient historical evidences and so i think what we need to do is apply i think at least two readings of ambedkar in in this sense one is the making of brahmin and a non-brahmin class in the process of this uh, uh buddhist and non-buddhist or anti-buddhist virtues and second is uh the is buddhist canon uh, enough uh, to to really uh, entail a certain limitations that Ambedkar might have provided in his own uh, reading of, of Buddha, and I think if if we are if we are able to address that critically, we might come out with with some something kind of a solid thesis. I believe. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm 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 a little bit unclear about some of the things that you were saying about Ashokan history and so on. Whether this is an argument about thinking about the question of political sovereignty. 
um, in some sense, uh, you know, and kind of back to, I think, the question that we were talking about and emancipatory uh, ideology, uh, a, a means of, of self formation, um, as opposed to a kind of political historical argument that is also put forward, right, by, by Ambedkar. So, you know, one, one, I think, encounters that contradiction. And uh, Suraj, I'm sort of thinking that, you know, some of the things you were suggesting about Ashokan history and so on, suggest that we think about the problem in some sense of maybe sovereignty um, um, and, and, um, and kind of state and state formation. Uh, coming together with the argument that's being made about uh, about Buddhism. I'm, I wasn't completely sure, but we are also at 1232. Um, and so I, I think the, uh, maybe what, you know, we've just sort of started the conversation um, and I had thought we might have a little more time to think about some of the particular texts uh, that have come up, you know, caste in India, revolution, counter-revolution. We haven't spoken about annihilation of caste at all, uh, but have really focused on the on the later writings. And, and I find that very interesting because I think of course that's where Ambedkar is, is most concerned in a sense with the question of, of uh, the kind of millennial structure of historical violence and hurt, if you will, on the one hand. Second, Brahmanism itself as both a kind of historical agent, but also as um, something, uh, as a kind of form, a social form that begins to open up other questions around um, ethics, around morality, and indeed about the social itself and the constitution of the social, um, something that uh, Ambedkar you know, repeatedly reminds us is impossible in the context of caste, that sociality, real social intercourse is, is unavailable, is precluded and so on. So the question of the historical deep time, politics, sovereignty, um, texts and textual reading. So what is Ambedkar's own archive? which is something that we also seem to have opened up in the conversation today. So what are the texts that he is reading and what, it, what would it mean to kind of go back and re-engage those texts and annotate in some sense Ambedkar's reading and to do so critically. Um, and then finally, um, I think this, this um, question of, of the kind of theories that we bring to bear on our own readings uh, with both of you, I think suggesting that um, we, we, we need to be slightly promiscuous, if I can put it that way, theoretically promiscuous in the theories that we adopt and use um, in order to, to approach someone who is as complex uh, as Ambedkar. Uh, but you know, maybe rooting this also in, in um, some more social historical context, which we haven't quite talked about today, but uh, I wonder if that uh, is something that seems important for either or both of you. But just maybe if I could give each of you a few minutes for last words, uh, you know, this is, this is, we've just begun the conversation. This is, you know, many, many hours and many months long. Uh, but somebody said, you know, what is an uncritical on Baker studies? And uh, I suppose that doesn't exist, uh, is what we're suggesting. Uh, one is always thinking with, um, but also against and critically and outside of a thinker's own modes of inhabiting certain forms of thought. So yes, I suppose there is no uncritical on Baker studies um, other than modes of either deification or uh, radical co-optation, which is something that uh, Suraj was talking about. But let me give each of you like three minutes maybe, and you will each have the last word. And I wanna thank everyone. I know there have been a few other questions in, uh, in the comments, uh, but uh, I, I will maybe ask you to take a look at the Q&A if you wanted to respond to anything. Uh, but there are also more uh, by nature of, I think, comments or really broad questions about thinking about Fule and Bitcoin and Nehru is it, uh, allowing us to have a kind of new perspective on the ways we approach uh, our, our present and our past. And these might be way, way too large for us today. So uh, Akash and Suraj, whatever you want to say uh, by way of final words. Suraj, you want to start? I mean, I'll, after you. Okay. <laughs> um, don't say age before beauty. Now, 
so a number of the things that we've brought up, I, I think all intersect at one, one genre, and that's biography. And I say this because it has to do with archive and what was accessible at the time to the biographers. It has to do with um, the, the a back and forth between the perception of Ambedkar in that uh, era to the biographer. And of course, it has to do with the ways that biographies in the vernacular are a bit more uh, deifying um, and, uh, and um, uh, biographies. I, I mean, I, I think you might have noticed that there are very many highly critical Hindi biographies from the right. And then there are very um, uh, hagiographic uh, biographies in, in Marathi and then in English there are different perspectives. But the late 1950s biographies, primarily Kir and Kharmode, those are 70 years old now. And uh, anyone who begins the process of trying to understand Ambedkar's life in order to understand his work um, and vice versa, easily sees serious problems in both uh, biographies. In, in Kears, of course, he was virulently anti-Muslim and, uh, and, and a number of the, I think, ficti fictitious um, meetings that Kier creates between um, uh, Savarkar and Ambedkar have led to a lot of the, you know, the last decade uh, people talking about uh, Ambedkar's relationship to the uh, right-wing thinking and an anti-Muslim thought and, and things like this. So, you know, there's a, a clear lineage of some of the bizarre speculation of today to some of the bizarre things that Kier uh, wrote. You know, I think he mentioned Savarkar 105 times in his biography. He was, Kier was as dedicated to Savarkar as he was to Ambedkar. And this shows throughout uh, the, the, the biography in so many ways. Um, and he was extremely sloppy as a historian. Uh, Karmadi, as you know, was very punctilious, but a third of his, other than his own source material, a third of his general information comes from the Kier biography. And, uh, you know, if you look at the letters exchanged between Karmode and LSE uh, in the 1950s, you see that they're sending misinformation back and forth. The LSE registrar had no idea what was going on with Ambedkar and writes things that are complete nonsense about his dates and they don't know his address and, you know, all sorts of things. They don't even know he's in London when the registrar says he's in India when he's actually five minutes away in London. So, and this information gets to Kharmodi, and then Kharmodi is asked to, to provide information to LSE, and he provides wrong information. Now, the strange thing about that is that a lot of the misinformation Kharmodi gets is by believing Ambedkar, and Ambedkar is notoriously uh, negligent with dates when it comes to himself. You know, he has a photographic memory when it comes to the penal code and so on, but if you ask him, what year were you in Baroda, he has no idea. Uh, he writes uh, different dates, different periods of time in his own autobiographical fragments. You know, he, he gives different uh, uh, dates for his um, sojourn in, in Baroda and so on. So Ambitka really didn't, as you know, autobiography was not Ambitka's thing, right? Even when he wrote autobiographical fragments, he prefaces it by his, that his, his arm is being twisted to do so. He just was not that... Um, Ego, egoistic to, to, to write his autobiography. And, and that's, that, that goes across with the way that in all of his speeches, his Marathi speeches especially, which are the most autobiographical ones, right? When, when Ambedkar writes in English, there's nothing autobiographical when he speaks in Marathi. It, there's a great deal of autobiographical information he shares with especially Dalit uh, audience. And in each of them, he changes the story a little bit. So, uh, so Karmadi's biography is... Uh, uh, full of factual errors because he just trusted whatever Ambedkar said and wrote it down. Um, so we have, and then you have the, you know, forget the Marathi biographies in the middle, but in around 2004, 2005, you have a series of biographies published by Zelliot and, and Yafilo and, 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 and um, uh, Omvent and so on. And if you look back, you can notice 
by the dates that they put, whether they were lying on Kir or on Karmodi, because the dates are almost always uh, wrong. So uh, one thing that I'm obsessed about now, 20 years on from those 2004, 2005 slew of biographies, is that we need, now Suraj is writing a biography, which is going to be uh, brilliant. I'm writing a biography, which is going to be pedantic, as you can tell. Um, but there are a number of others. Ashok Gopal is writing a biography for, uh, for Navayana. Uh, Nishikan Kolge is writing a biography for Ram Guha's uh, 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 series. Um, so we're going to get in 2022, 20, 23, 24, probably four or five new biographies. And what I feel is that these biographies are going to be informed by the way that Ambedkar studies have changed. And these biographies, you know how... Kiyad is one of the most cited uh, pieces of literature in all of Ambedkar and Dalit studies, right? And these biographies are themselves going to um, change the way that Ambedkar studies uh, uh, unfolds for the next uh, decade or two. So one of the things that in my last three minutes, which is probably six now, one of the things that I wanted to, yeah, (laughs) one of the things I wanted to point out is that we have so many gaps in our understanding of the person of Ambedkar, of the person of Ambedkar. I mean, none of the biographies are even personality driven, right? The, you have thought and work, you have intellectual biographies and so on. There are very few personality driven uh, Ambedkars. What was he like as a person? So until we get a new slew of biographies giving new information from new archives, giving um, uh, correcting misinformation from previous biographies and myths and legends and so on, we're going to, uh, uh, until that happens, we're going to sort of be be trapped in this scattering of archives and misinformation and so on. I think once these new bi- biographies come out, there's, it's, it's going to inaugurate a new phase of, uh, of Ambedkar studies, whether critical or not, where once again, we look back at con- questions of continuity and discontinuity, questions of uh, what did he fundamentally uh, pursue you know, in, in his own life? Was he, as the, as the right wing claim, was he a, a British stooge? Was he an opportunist? And, and all of these things. These questions will be approached afresh. And I think with greater sort of a greater, stronger foothold than they can be now relying on the biographies that are really packed with 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 a lot of uh, misinformation the historian in me likes likes the pedantic likes the dating likes the uh tracking down of the info the one thing that i would say though is um you know about the question of autobiography um i think one can read casts one can read the annihilation of caste and the opening um i think those are deeply autobiographical works but that's a conversation for uh for another time but i think this question of political biography and inaugurating and its relationship to critical and Baker studies um is is really important thank you for that suraj please i mean i think um i just would like to uh, you asked about the Ashokan kind of piece. I, I, I wanted to make the point that it, there was this existing, there still is existing this kind of internal tension within the Pali studies uh, 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 scholars about uh, this reliance or obfuscation or all reliance on the Ashoka as a link. And, and what I was saying was that the Ambedkar approach uh, is, is, is sometimes confounding that the uh, intellectual trajectory he takes to address Buddhism uh, doesn't really uh, fit easily in either of these internal tensions. And I think that's the kind of missing piece that I was I was trying to uh, address. Uh, but also I think uh, Ambedkar's relationship with uh, with uh, with Buddha as, as a person, as a thinker, as a philosopher, liberator is, is something that has that has much more uh, uh, nuanced register. It is quite layered. Uh, then, 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 and 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 then saying that he wrote Buddhan is the man he had visualized, like he had thought, or he was impressed by Buddha by the age of, which is which is factually correct, and and you know it can be uh, cited in multiple uh, uh, ways. Uh, but if you have to really approach Ambedkar's other texts with kind of correspond to uh, Ashokan kind of intervention, I was more thinking about how uh, the idea of granting a uh, a selfhood 
as a supreme sovereign rather being a subordinate serf is what one can kind of ins- kind of draw from the Ashokan history. And I think that is where the kind of Dalit history can mature itself by placing uh, itself into the center of Ashokan discourses, not least the various edicts and, and you know, 150 years later, the whatever he could gather, he, he erected. But what I'm saying is like, there is, that is one of the closest link and we can find much more kind of a Dalit humanity to, to, kind, of, to kind of work on. I, and, I, and I just want to uh, uh, say that, you know, the, uh, sorry, Akash's point about, you know, this, this you know, there is a, uh, there might be a possibility that the Dharanjay Kir edition is going to be republished and they might invite me to write a forward. There has been a, I don't know, but there is a possibility. So it was very good to kind of get uh, this perspective because I think, um, you know, there has been a much more um, difficulty with, uh, and Akash is right, Ambedkar at one point, I think he says, he's, he's not even sure if he was born on 14th April. And, you know, so he's he's giving all this, you know, uh, I, I don't know if he's trying to be mischievous with this public who wants to celebrate him or, or whatnot, but there has been a lot of historical, you know, inaccuracy. And one of the things, uh, you know, uh, I personally don't want to do is, is like, you know, uh, do this, uh, uh, but, but proffer how Ambedkar could be, you know, there are various ways of approaching a biography, right? A person dealing with multiple uh, forms and multiple domains. And I think one of the things, challenges I am currently facing is, is that, uh, uh, that his scholarship, which is his PhD, uh, how 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 interestingly it gets divorced uh, down the line and it, it really doesn't get this uh, but i think that's the conversation for another day but it remains that i think we can we can really chew on ambedkar as Ambed- ambedkar can be a hermeneutic exercise for all of us kind of one can deal one can take a text and really uh, hammer and come out with something and that's what happened with marx right any big thinkers that's what happened with them lot of critical reflections, a lot of critical citations brought about what is Marxism today or any other philosophy uh, for that matter. And I think Ambedkar uh, remains to be tested. And I'm confident uh, this era uh, will do that work. There was, uh, we're, we're trying to release at least the Q&A. We've got about 11 questions. Uh, and I think Akash was going to type a response or maybe wanted to offer a quick one. This goes to something that both of you have spoken about, which is the need actually for biography, howsoever critical. And somebody has sort of asked whether we really need biographies uh, to evaluate uh, ideas because we do so all the time without needing to know quite so much about the person. Um, so having talked about you know, annot- archive annotation and the edited volumes through which you kind of come into uh, particular stakes in your own reading of Ambedkar, uh, we've kind of ended at biography, which is extremely interesting. Um, and if either of you wanted to say something about the need for biography, please do, and then we can end. Um, uh, uh. I, I think I sort of passionately gave my point of view. I, of course, we evaluate ideas without looking at uh, uh, people's personal histories. But one of the issues that we started with, and that you know, I'm I'm extremely passionate uh, about being not uh, being uh, non dalit is the relationship of your uh, your work, your output, uh, the structure of knowledge, and so on, and your social location, your position your uh, identity. And so this, um, irrespective of whether you think that biographies can be, that the, that a personal narrative can be uh, uh, separated from a person's uh, thought, it's not only about finding out about Ambedkar's thought, it's about this triangular relationship between you and that thought, because obviously your location your background uh, affects the way that you read uh, uh, as well. And so certain insights about uh, similarities and dissimilarities between you, your historical context, and um, that author whom you believe you're reading in some abstract way uh, uh, is, is um, I think, crucially important when, when you realize that reading and writing are social phenomena, they're not merely intellectual ones. I put my email in the Q 
Q&A, I think it goes to everyone. If, if there are questions that anyone wants to follow up on, more than happy to do it on, on mail. I've eaten up all of Anupama's time. I, I, will, I, will give, I will give Suraj um, uh, his time as well for any, any final thoughts, and then we will close. Uh, I think I see incredible questions. I just saw that, and I think most of them are answered. Uh, one of them is uh, Akash, or sorry, Vikas Tatar, and you know, Vikas, brilliant scholar, <laughs> has joined Columbia. We all celebrate you, and I think I want to recognize his question in this matter where he's asking me uh, the kind of a uh, archive, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, and I think it's a brilliant question. Books, music, films, and I think it's everything. <laughs> you know, uh, what what I'm concerned is now is that we rub shoulders uh, and also we rub our minds in person as well as in distance with existing other political, social, philosophical projects that are existing. It could be community oriented, it could be discipline oriented, it could be something that is to do with culture. We need to really establish ourselves as an important entity in whatever is happening in the globe. And, and so it could go in various directions and whichever directions you are, pick it up and, and contribute because whatever you will do is going to create. So what we need to do is for next generation to then build upon it. What Ambedkar did essentially was, and people don't understand, especially from looking at the lit perspectives, he's created us for so much of a, uh, he has given us so much armament and arsenal, arsenal for us to then take on and deploy uh, on our oppressors and also in our, in our own aspiration of our own future our own pride, our own dignity within the a cauldron of what we have, this Brahminical India. And, and that's why uh, it, is, it, is, it is essential that if we approach his texts, if we approach his speeches, if we approach his editorials, there is something, a message he's giving to Dalits. And I think this was, uh, this is always the case that, you know, his audience are two. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes his audience is not Dalit. And, but, but I have a feeling, somebody is saying it, but I was feeling, he, I have a feeling his audience is always Dalit. Somewhere it is. He might not necessarily make it a subject of it, you know, uh, who were the Shudras and all, but there is a message. It's, not, it's, it's almost like a dog whistle in a way that what I'm trying to do is trying to give you, look upon this, build upon it, maybe, uh, maybe break it into pieces and, and create something, tear it apart, but this is it. Now create so that Ambedkar archive now needs to be supplemented with what we have in, in today's context. And, and so I, I always tell people who really try to belittle Ambedkar or belittle Dalit intellectuals by reducing them to a certain uh, paraphernalia of academic uh, entitlements, uh, titles and all of that, just say that, you know, there is a logician in Ambedkar. He is not really thinking without that. There is a grammarian in Ambedkar because he's also reading the grammarians of the era. So he's not... He's not, he's not totally coming from the vacuum. He has that background. He has that base. He has been, you know, he's been experimenting with these ideas. And, and so uh, when we approach Ambedkar, uh, if you want to approach systematically, we have to learn what systematic is. And for the public sphere that Anu was talking about, we really also need to create that public sphere to then understand that the Ambedkar that is trying to fit in public sphere is not yet created. It is existing in various fragments. It has not been theorized as critically because it is not your civil society. It is not your political culture. It is not this kind of cultural politics of post-colonialism. Ambedkar's public sphere exists within the Dalits and how they operate. And they don't fit easily. They always protest, they challenge, they throw they throw a lot of enormous, which is amongst themselves as well. So I think for that subjectivity to be understood, we really need to create that public sphere in the academic engagements as well as non-academic spheres. So then Ambedkar then becomes much more visible, much more almost like a Lego fitting to the other Lego of this public sphere. I, I love that final um, comment. And, and I think it's uh, both very inspirational and it's very moving and it's politically necessary. It is uh, both natural and necessary. And, and I, I, I'm going to leave, leave us with that. Um, Suraj, thanks very, very much. Because I think what you've also spelled out is precisely the project of engaged and public pedagogy. This is People's Education Society. This is the project of mass intellectuality. This is the claim on the right to think, you know? And we kind of started with some of that and some of the exclusions of uh, institutions and knowledge forms. And uh, 
we kind of end, I think, uh, somewhere else. So I want to thank you both very much. And uh, to all of our uh, participants for being a little patient. Uh, we went over time, but this is like the start of a seminar that's uh, many months ongoing. So we shall try to bring, bring uh, Suraj and Akash back again in some other form. <laughs> Maybe actually really in person. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, thank everybody. You.